hopefully is have a little fun and, and also learn something. We're going to make a couple of changes in the syllabus. So if you want to take a, if you want to get out your syllabus and follow along, you notice that it says today that today we were going to review writing three, but we are not going to do that today. We're going to review writing three on March six, a week from today. So you mean to tell me I did my homework on time and it doesn't count? Of course it counts. Of course it counts. Getting it in on time count always counts. Or we're gonna we're not gonna have a chance to review it. Okay. This one you're only gonna review with a peer. You may or may not get comments from me. You should know by now what kind of things your writing gets commented about. What I say to you about your writing. And in general, as you're looking at going from this shorter paper to the longer paper, that is from the the 250 to 500 words to the 750 words, which is your requirement in, uh, uh, in the paper you're going to turn in for a grade. The big deal is, the important thing is, be more concrete. It's one thing to say, for example, I've been stereotyped in the past as a dumb jock and never tell me about an incident in which that stereotype affected you. Right, Mike? So it's fine, Mike, if you were to say that. I don't think you've ever been stereotyped that way. You may have been stereotyped as a big guy. Right? Solid. Tell me about an incident where, where that stereotype affected you. It could be positive, it could be negative. Like, I've always been stereotyped as a big guy, and because of that, when I was in the playground with my little brother and some kids were picking on him, all I had to do was walk up and everything stopped. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to know. But I want more detail than that. Okay? More detail than just that, that my little brother was being picked on and I stopped. I want to know more about that fight. That will get you to 750 words easily. Don't be afraid to give details. Second, um, the paper, the writing will be due at 11 on March 1, and then we'll review it on March 3, or March 6, rather. Uh, March 1, we're going to have uh, a student-led discussion on the idea of listening and memory. Does DeVito bring any evidence to support his contentions about memory? Um, what about notes? What kind of notes system, uh, system of note-taking do you use? We'll We'll probably have some small group discussion there. And then we're going to watch a video once we finish talking about notes and how notes function. We'll have student-led discussion, and I'll lead a little bit of a discussion. But we're going to talk about how notes function in, in uh, creating memory. And then we're going to let you look at notes watch a video, look at notes, and then take a test in class. Okay? It's a 10 question, 10 question test to see if you comprehended what was in the video. Okay, so that's, that's coming up on Thursday. Who would like to lead our student discussion on Thursday? Anybody? 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 This Thursday? Melody, Taryn, and Katie have all earned this 25 Thursday. points. This Thursday? This Thursday. This Thursday. Anybody? Oh, it's on note taking, discussion of note taking and listening. Me and Jessica will do that. All right, excellent, ladies. Me and Jessica will do Jessica and Shelby, you rock. You rock. Hey, James. Hey, come sit over there, James. He's good back there. Just come on, James. Come on, James. James, everybody wants to be near you. Yeah. He's a book in the Bible. Come on, now. He's what? He's a book in the Bible. He's a book in the Bible. He is that. You, so what? You are Stephen. I'm a deacon. In the you are the first stoned apostle. Mm -hmm. But I led. I was, Is that explaining your your reason? You're sleeping. Yeah. That you're the first stoned apostle. All right. <laughs> Onward we go. It was at least for doing something right, though.
Uh, DeVito doesn't talk about this at all in his chapter 3. We're, we're starting on chapter 3 on listening. And today we're going to be talking about listening. Uh, you won't really need your text. Um, I was going to get to the ethical, communicating ethically on page 48, but we really don't have enough time. I just want to say this about impression management, which runs from 46 to 50. Impression management does talk about things that we do to manage others' impressions of us. The thing about this is if we do it consciously and we try too hard, we end up like Mitt Romney. Mitt has, Mitt has tried so hard to show us that he's not a multi-billionaire that everybody goes, you're trying way too hard, dude. I don't believe you. So we end up with a credibility gap if we try hard. On the other hand, we naturally do many of these things in order to manage impression. And we can do some of them uh, uh, to manage impression consciously as long as they are integrated with our personality. If it doesn't feel to others as if we have a toolbox from which we're dragging this out in order to make you do something. Everybody resents being made to do something. Everybody does. You know, I get, I get phone calls. I'm a regular Democrat, and I, and I contribute to my party on a regular basis. I get phone calls every day. And you can, I can show them, well, I can't show them that way. I can show you in my phone menu all the calls that I have missed that say restricted. These are pit folks who have been hired by the Democratic Party to fundraise. And because I'm a regular Democrat, they're calling me. If you are a regular Republican, they'll, or somebody like this will be calling you. How do they get your number? Because I gave, I gave money once. Okay. You give money once and you're done for life. Forever, forever. Okay? I don't answer these because this is a way of managing impression that I find that I resent. They don't want me to, to know who it is. You know? So I have to be curious and pick it up. I don't pick it up. Okay? So if you feel that it's if you feel that it is not integral to the person, you will resent. It. And then you won't you won't go with it. Alright, on to the ladder of listening. This comes from Michael and Susan Osborne. They were, uh, Michael and Susan were my teachers in graduate school, which is why I like this. Michael and Susan say that listening is a process, not a product. Listening is a process that extends from the most primitive kind of awareness to the most sophisticated form of reception. And there should be a close quote there, but there is not. I didn't edit very well. So if we stop for just a second and listen, just listen. What sounds do you become aware of, Megan? Um, the, the lights or the... You can hear the lights. You can actually hear the, the ballast, particularly in these two that are not, well, that one's out entirely, but that one's going out. And you people moving around. People moving around, okay. Cece, what do you what do you hear? <laughs> do you hear James Snifflin? Yeah, it's okay to name it. It's okay to name it. Jeremiah, what do you hear? Definitely that. I don't know. Just might giggling around. Does anybody hear the anybody hear the fan in the back? Yeah. Is it annoying? <laughs> no, not, not, when, not when other things are going on. It becomes white noise and we pay no attention to it. We, are, we become aware of a sound and learn to give it some meaning only when it, we are, attend to it. The most primitive level, then, is that level of attention. Or... 
discriminative listening. We discriminate between just white noise and sound that has meaning. If we were an electrician and we came in here and we heard that, that lamp, everybody hears that lamp now, right? <coughs> and it won't go away. You don't hear that lamp? No, I hear the fan back there. You hear the, well, you, just because you're so close to the fan. You hear this lamp. If you're an electrician, you come in and you go, oh, that means that I have to change bulbs. Okay. Discriminative listening. You discriminate between sound and noise. Second, comprehensive listening. And this is what we're going to work on on Thursday. Comprehensive listening is listening in order to get a message. It is the second step. Once we've decided this is meaningful, we now must decide what does it mean. Comprehensive listening is easily improved. What must you do to be a better comprehensive listener? Caitlin, what must you do to be a better comprehensive listener? You have to you have to attend to the to the noise. Right? You have to attend to it. What decision will help you attend? What decision will help you attend? Everybody? The decision that the decision that the grade matters. What other decision that you, must you make in order for this? When you are talking to a friend, when you are talking to a friend, and we're gonna we're gonna do this to, to Katie and Melody. When you're talking to a friend, Emily, mm -hmm. how do you decide to how do you become a better comprehensive listener? You make the decision, like the conscious decision, to pay attention to what they're saying. Yeah, that that they're, that what they're saying is important, right? What they're saying is important. So you've got to make that decision that what they're saying is important in order to comprehend. The first thing is make make sure that you know it's important. Second, Cody. Second, once you've decided it's important, what's the next thing you can do to improve your listening? Exactly. You become an active listener rather than a passive listener. Too many of you, uh, and I'm gonna, we're going to be talking about note taking, uh, but too many of you are passive listeners, particularly in class. And even when you've decided the grade is important to you, if you're a passive listener, you're less likely to take what comes into your short-term memory and move it to your long-term memory. Active listening. Lots of techniques for it. And we'll talk more about it next time. Active listening it is important to our comprehension. It is seeking to understand the meaning of the speaker. We move next uh, up the ladder. Once I've understood your meaning, at least on the surface, I can be empathic. Anybody have a definition for empathy? Understanding the other person's emotions. Empathy is literally a feeling with another. Sympathy is feeling for another. And sympathy has its place. You know, my, my aunt in, in, or my cousin in Sweden, 89 years old, passed away uh, two weeks ago, and I sent uh, a note to her daughter, I'm so sorry to hear that your mother has passed away. That's sympathy. Nothing wrong with that. Empathy, though, is when we come to understand the other's feelings so that we share them. It is a matter of going beyond sympathy to trying to walk in the other's shoes, to feel with the other's feelings. Appreciative listening follows. Because if I can understand your meaning, I get your meaning, and I get your feelings, 
when they truly come to appreciate what you have to say. It's, appreciation is not the same as agreement. I may appreciate what you have to say, but disagree with it heartily. But I appreciate it. This is also the case, and, and I think why many people don't like classical music. How many of you, how many of you ever put on, just without, without bidding, just put on a classical CD? Shostakovich, Mozart, for anything. There's two radio stations in Manhattan that I always listen to. That are classical stations. Yeah. yeah. But Katie's the only one. Why don't you, the rest of you do that? Why don't you listen to it? Cody? What? The, Why don't you listen to it? Uh, I didn't grow up with it. I mean, as far as I go back, it's probably the 70s. Right, and which is, which is just rock and roll. Yeah. It's but she's cool. listening to Beethoven, Bach, Brahms, right. Wagner. Yeah. Liszt. I fall asleep. Chopin. You fall asleep. Why do you fall asleep? Why do you dislike it? Because I have no understanding. Because you have no understanding. Absolutely mm -hmm. right, Cody. You hit the nail on the head. If you, if you don't comprehend the meaning and the feelings of, with music, music is really about your feelings. It's not about the lyric. It's about your feelings. If you don't comprehend the lyric, the feelings, and, it, and come to feel with those feelings, you cannot possibly appreciate. And therefore, you tend to ignore. Um, it isn't really all that hard to learn to appreciate classical music, but people choose not to. They have other things they want to do with their time, which is fine. But if you want to, you can learn to love classical music. You don't have to love it all the time, but at least some of the time. So it builds on comprehension and empathy. It values the speaker's utterance without judging its correctness or validity. The next level is critical listening. And now we do want to, I may appreciate what you have to say. I may, I may understand your feelings. I may understand your meanings. But when it comes down to it, and I look at your meanings, I see that there are some problems with the inferences you have drawn. I can, I can see that perhaps you haven't, you and I don't share the same factual world. That perhaps there are some problems that we, we in your reasoning or mine. But I come to understand how you put your world together and then I can be Critical in the sense of understanding how it comes together. So critical listening builds upon all of the previous le levels and evaluates the quality. Our general education requirements say that we're going to look at improving your comprehensive, improving your empathic, and improving your critical listening skills. And we're working on improving your comprehensive this week. And we will test that. Finally, the ladder of listening moves us to the constructive listening side. And this is where our listening gets past that, how did you reason your way to that? I see where you're coming from, but I don't agree with your point. And we move into, well, then is there a place where we can find agreement? Am I partly wrong? Are there new things to say? We're looking for a new way to build a new community. So our final step, step in the ladder of listening then is constructive. It seeks to build community by being reflective and careful. And reflective listening is a technique which when you start to learn it, you will feel is uncomfortable and phony. And if I use this with my wife and she catches me at it, 
I must stop because it does feel uncomfortable and phony. Reflective listening means that when I hear you say something, I will say things like, so Melody, I hear you saying, Katie, uh, does that mean that? And I will paraphrase and restate, you know, in an attempt to get at a deeper level of meaning that you might be carrying. Reflective listening techniques are very, very important to building empathic and constructive listening. They are important in, in being an active listener. They are easily learned techniques, and at the first, they feel phony. As they become part of your personality, they actually will work to get you at a very different place. And in small group life, are vitally important to a group taking on a life of its own. Any of you who, who have an interest in a small group, like if you are a member of a sorority or fraternity, or you are your major includes, and everybody's major actually is going to include this, your major includes group work, and you'd like to get your groups, the groups of which you are a part, to function better, I invite you in the in the interterm of 2013 to join us in small group communication. Uh, it's four weeks. We, we spend a lot of time working on listening skills and group building skills. All right, that's the first part of our class. We're going to turn off the camera. Stephen, poke him. Somebody poke him. Thank you. Stephen, push the red button. Oh my God, Dave.